Good morning, and welcome to Silver Lakes Community Church. Let's go ahead and start out with a word of prayer. Almighty God, we just thank you and praise you for this day. We thank you for your blessings on our life. We thank you for your presence in our life. Father, I ask that you would be with us as, as your church, that we would be the kind of people that you died for and that you live for. Father, I ask that you'd be with our nation, that as we go through this uh, time of craziness, this time of turmoil, that you would just reveal yourself as Savior and Lord, that you would reveal yourself as God, and that you would give us the message of the good news. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. I want to st uh, start out with a video, uh, Pentecost by the Skit Guys. The Spirit of God hovered over the waters at the moment of creation, like the universe exploding outward from the single spark of God's Word. So the church became real. Put your hand on the ground. The earth itself is vibrating. The mountains, the oceans, the deserts, the creatures that live here are all breathing in. The planet is inhaling. Imagine the song it will sing, the song of Pentecost. Joy enveloped the disciples. Their words were understood and welcomed. Their joy was contagious. Their message was heard and translated and shared. The church moved into the world, bringing light, bringing love, covering all there was. There was no denying it. There was no going back. The church as we know it was born. God, we feel your presence. Let us use it. Let us take this rush, this moment, this Pentecost, shouting into a world that is bored stiff by life. We have been made aware of the presence of the creator of the universe. Give us the strength to keep it going. God is real. The church is born. The song goes on and everyone can sing. Amen. Look at the church today, as we look at the message today, one of the things we have to understand and realize is this isn't our church. This isn't my church. This is Jesus' church. This is God's church. We are God's people. And I think what we need to understand is if we are God's people and we are God's church, then we must take on God's message I think one of the problems that we have is a lot of people say they want to communicate. They want to have a conversation, but they really don't want to um, have a conversation. And I, I think what we need to be doing is praying uh, for the hearts and minds of those in our community and those in our nation that they would begin to actually want a two-way conversation and that we would be able to present the good news and present the truth. Um, so many people, they say they want something or they say they, they say they know what they want, but the reality proves they don't. And I think we need to pray for hearts to be opened, minds to be changed, so that we can uh, be able to see people actually come to Christ's church, to um, the message of the good news. So I want to look at today Pentecost, but I want to look at it uh, in, in, a, in a different way. I want to look at it as the message of Pentecost. Um, the message about Pentecost wasn't tongues, and the excitement of Pentecost wasn't tongues. It was Jesus Christ empowering his people and building his church and the message was all as you read uh, the day of Pentecost there was more said about who Jesus Christ was and is than about anything else and the message is that there is good news um, yesterday today and forever and that good news is Jesus Christ and so as we start I want to look at Acts chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. On the day of Pentecost, seven weeks after Jesus' resurrection, the believers were meeting together in one place. 
Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm in the skies above them, and it filled the house where they were meeting. And then what looked like flames of tongues or of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. And so I want to key in on that. Number one, it says the Holy Spirit did this. It wasn't the people doing this. It was God working through obedient, willing people. And one of the things we need to understand is if it's God's church, then God is leading, that God is initiating, that God is doing the work through us. As we, as we think about how church has created this or made this, we need to go back and look at it how God did it. Um, people were waiting in unison, expecting God to do something because that's what he said would happen. They weren't praying for a certain thing to happen. They were expecting God to show up and do what God can do. I think that's what we need to get back to. Okay, God, this is your church. You take charge. This is your church. It's not about what I want or uh, think I need. It's about you showing up and doing what only you can do. And so I think the key in is it says, as the Holy Spirit gave them ability. Now I want to go back to Matthew chapter 16, verse 15. It says, and then he, he asked them, who do you say I am? He had been saying, oh, who do people think I am? And they gave all these different answers, but then he got very specific. Who do you say I am? And so Simon Peter, he always had an answer, and he, he spoke up, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And so as you look at that verse, Peter says, you are the anointed one sent by God, empowered by God, you are the Son of the living God. And so what Peter was saying essentially is, you're Lord. You're God. You're the one that was promised. You were the one that was foretold. You were the one we were waiting for to come and save your people. Now, Jesus replied, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because you are so wise and you are so awesome and you are so powerful and you are so. No, Jesus said, You are blessed. Because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You're blessed because you didn't come up with this answer on your own. You're blessed because God, my Father in heaven, revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. I think that's huge. Because so many of us think, well, you know, God could use me because I'm this or that or the other thing. But God can use anyone who is willing to let Him work and let Him reveal Himself to us. So one of the keys that we have to understand about this is God wasn't saying, Peter, you're super special. You see, the thing is, is when we look at the Bible and the Bible says somebody is blessed, so many times as human beings, we say, oh, they're so perfect. They're so awesome. They're, God had to use them because they're so blessed. No, what he is saying is you are blessed. You're increased because God has given this to you. You're blessed not because of you. You're blessed because God did something. You're blessed because God chose to do this at this time through you. So it, 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 you have to take Peter out of the equation in the sense of the blessing because all he is is receiving the blessing. And so the blessing is, is powerful and important because of who does the blessing. And in this case, it is God. So in verse 18, it says, And now I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And so some have misinterpreted that to think that P 
Peter is what the church is built on. But when you listen to this message today, and if you actually read Scripture, the church is not built on Peter. The church is built on Jesus Christ. He is the chief cornerstone. And I want you to see, it says, okay, I'm changing your name to Peter, the rock. And at the same time, it's upon this rock. Not Peter, but upon this rock, Jesus Christ, that I will build my church. What is the rock? The rock is that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Building, as Paul said, on a sure foundation, true doctrine. And so the church is built on the understanding that Jesus Christ is the anointed Messiah, the Son of the living God. And notice Jesus says, I will build my church. He doesn't say he's going to build Rome's church. He doesn't say he's going to build the Baptist church. He doesn't say he's going to build the Methodist church. He doesn't say he's going to build Peter's church. He says, I'm going to build my church. And when I build my church, all the powers of hell will not conquer it. You see, it doesn't say they won't come against us, but it says they won't conquer it. If we are truly, truly, truly God's church, then nothing is going to stop it because it's God's church and God is in control. And so as you look at this truth, it says, I will build my church and the gates of hell, the powers of hell will not prevail or conquer it. I want to look at Psalm 118. Verses 22 through 24. Notice what it says here. It says, The stone rejected by the builders has now become the cornerstone. And it says, This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous to see. Now, I want you to think about this. Peter um, hadn't come along yet, so it couldn't be talking about Peter, it says the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And notice it says, this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous to see. Marvelous to see. And then I like the next verse. In, in verse 24, it says, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I think this should be our motto every day. Doesn't matter what's happening, doesn't matter what we don't have or don't get to do or whatever, um, this is the day that the Lord has made. And we will choose to rejoice and be glad in it. You know, there's a lot of stuff in life we don't like, and there's a lot of stuff we don't think is fair, but the bottom line is, doesn't matter. God still made the day, God still made us, and we have a lot to rejoice in if we choose to. Now, notice what it said, the stone that was rejected. Now, let's jump forward to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, starting in verse 42. It says, then Jesus asked them, didn't you, didn't you ever read in this in the scriptures? The stone rejected by the builders has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous to see. And so... He's asking them, haven't you read the Psalms where it said this? He's, he's asking them, haven't you ever seen this? In verse 43, it says, What I mean is that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation that will produce the proper fruit. And so remember, he was presented to the Israelites first, and they rejected him. The, the Jewish leaders rejected him. The Sanhedrin and, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they rejected him. They um, didn't accept the anointed one. And so guess what? It was given to the Gentiles for a time. And we've studied this so many times. It was given to the Gentiles because they were willing to follow God's lead and be his church. And then they were used... To bring the Israelites back. To make the Israelites jealous of this relationship 
that we as the Gentiles had with God. Now, in verse 44, it says, Anyone who stumbles over that stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. And so we understand that Jesus Christ is that cornerstone. Jesus Christ is the rock that the church is built on. Jesus Christ is the perfect one, the infallible one, the one that is perfect to tie everything together. And so as we look at this, it says God is doing this. It's God orchestrating it. It's Him building His church. And you know what? If we reject Him as His people, if we reject Him as it being His church, and we want to rewrite Scripture, and we want to change what we, what we know to be true, He will remove the lampstand, and He will go to a people that will accept Him as Lord and Savior. And He will work through a church that is willing to say, yes, Lord, it's not our church, it's yours. Now, I want to look at uh, Zechariah chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 7. And I'm, I'm making this case here. This is God's church. It's God's power. It's God's authority. Remember last week, we talked about going into all the world. And, and before he told us to go into all the world, he says, I want you to know this. I have been given all authority. I've been given the name that's above every name. King of kings, Lord of lords. I've been given all authority, so now therefore you go, because you're going in my authority. You see, it's my church, and you're my people, and you have my spirit, and therefore you go in my name and my authority. So as I continue to build this case, I want to look at this illustration in Zechariah chapter 4, starting at verse 1. It says, Then the angel who had been talking with me returned and woke me as though I had been asleep. What do you see now? he asked. I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl of oil on top of it. Around the bowl are seven lamps, each one having seven spouts with wicks. Now, we don't have time to um, take apart this um, prophecy and get each detail down. But what I want to look at is some of the, the main parts of it. Verse 3 says, And I see two olive trees, one on each side of the bowl. Then I asked the angel, What are these, my Lord? What do they mean? Don't you know, the angel asked. No, my Lord, I replied. I think that's a key place to be. When God gives you a vision, when God gives you a dream, don't just assume that you know what it means. I think all of us need to have that humility that says, okay, God, I think I understand what you're saying, or maybe I have a clue, but I want you to reveal it. I want you to tell me. Verse 6 says, then he said to me, this is what the Lord says to Zerubbabel, it is not by force, nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. You need to be aware of what he says there. It is not by force, nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Verse 7 goes on, nothing, not even a mighty mountain will stand in Zerubbabel's way. It will flatten out before him. Then Zerubbabel will set the final stone of the temple in place. And at that time, the people will shout, May God bless it. May God bless it. And so what he's saying is that Zerubbabel is going to rise up and be victorious. And he's going to um, be able to conquer and then build this temple. And so he's going to set this cornerstone, which the whole temple is connected to. Notice the theme of this cornerstone. And so Zerubbabel is going to do it. And people are going to obviously look to that and say, Almighty Zerubbabel, you were a champion, you were a victor, and you built our temple. 
Oh, mighty Peter, you are the rock and you built the church. Sounds similar? But I want you to know, before God said Zerubbabel would be victorious and build the temple, he says, I want you to be aware of this, Zerubbabel. It's not by your strength. It's not by your might. It's not by your intellect. It's not by your understanding or your plan. It's not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And what David said was this is something God is doing. This is what the Spirit is doing. And then what Jesus said is this is what God is doing. And it's a great thing. And so as we look at these things, we need to understand it's not by us being perfect. It's not by us being completely right with God. It's not by, by us being talented or clever, or smart, or knowing everything. It's by the Spirit of the living God. Peter was blessed because the Spirit of the living God revealed to him the answer. Peter was blessed because God was doing something. And we are blessed because God is doing something. God built His church and Jesus Christ is still the Lord of the church, and He's still the owner of the church, and He's still doing a great thing. And He's still been given all authority, and He's still sitting at the right hand of God the Father, the King of kings, the Prince of peace, the Lord of lords, the great I am, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we stay here today, we sit here today, we stand here today as His church, called by His name, empowered by Him. Now it's coming up to this, that I want to give the message of Pentecost, because it hasn't changed. It's still God doing what God does. In Acts chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Then Peter stepped forward with the eleven other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. Some of you are saying these people are drunk. It isn't true. It's much too early for that. People don't get drunk by 9 o'clock in the morning. Now, what you see this morning was predicted centuries ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God said, in the final days, God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. This miracle that you're seeing, this marvelous display that you're seeing, it's not the people, it's God pouring out his spirit. Now, what we know here is that the Holy Spirit came upon His people who were waiting for Him. And then people started gathering to see what God was doing. And they were confused and they were perplexed and they were questioning and they were wondering and they are trying to figure it out. And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, stood up and began to speak. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, moved by the Holy Spirit, got up. And began to speak. And he says, this is answer to one of the prophecies. In the last days, God said, in the last days, I will do something. And it says, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. Prophecy means to speak forth the word of God. God says, when... The Spirit comes upon you, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. When the Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power and you will become my witnesses. And in a real sense to this, what we have to understand, in a real sense this, what God is saying is, you'll speak for me. And so in a real sense to this, we could say, when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we will prophesy as God prophesies.
promised would happen because we will speak forth his word. We're not foretelling the future. We're speaking the word of God as God wants it spoken. And so as you see this, God says, this is what I said would happen. In those days, verse 18 says, I will pour out my spirit. See, he keeps repeating himself because it gets, it has to go back to this is a God thing. God's going to do something. God's going to do something. It's God's church and God wants to do something. We need to get out of the way and let God do something. I will pour out my spirit on all my servants. Notice it says all my servants. Men and women alike, all my servants, and they will prophesy. They will speak my message. They will speak my words. I will do this through my servants. So there's a key here. You have to be a servant to the Lord. You have to be a believer in Christ. You have to be one that is obedient, serving the Lord. Why is God going to pour out His Spirit upon you if you're not willing to speak? Why is God going to pour out His, servant, His, His Spirit upon you if you're not willing to serve? If you just want to be a spectator and not do anything, why would God waste His time pouring out His power upon you to do nothing? What, what amazes me is people that they put all this money into a high-performance vehicle and then they cover it up in the garage. Why would you put all this energy and power into a car and then not rev it up a few times and, and take it out and in legal ways show what it can do? I, I, I mean, the bottom line is it's pointless. One of the worst things, <clears throat> travesty, is you get some person and they buy this high-performance vehicle, you know, a Porsche or a, a Corvette or, or you know, a, a Dodge Challenger, you know, Hemi, and, and, then, and then they get out on the 15 and they do 25 miles an hour. I don't know about you, but there's been some times where I've almost lost my salvation in the fury of somebody wasting that power. At least go the speed limit. At least show how fast you can get to the speed limit. Do something with it. You know, we as Christians, we ask for God to give us wisdom. Well, what good is it to sit there and ask for wisdom if we're not willing to apply the wisdom that God gives us? If we're not willing to do anything with it, why is God going to waste His time to pour out His Spirit? We're praying for revival. But why pray for revival if you're not willing to change? Why pray for revival if you're not willing to become a servant of God? Why pray for revival if you're not willing for God to breathe some new life in you and get rid of some of the dead stuff? I will pour out my spirit on my servants. And they will prophesy. They will speak. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon will be turned uh, blood red before the great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. And so we know some of this hasn't happened, but we know it's coming. We know that some of this hasn't happened, but it's been foretold. But, but notice in, in verse 9, it says, I will do all these things. We want to sit there and say, oh, well, you know, it's probably going to be a nuclear bomb or, you know, that sounds really um, just like if one of these um, super geysers goes off and causes a big earthquake and the smoke and all this stuff. 
But, but notice, the key of this is not the event. The key of this is, I will. I will. I will pour out my spirit. I will do these things. See, what we need to understand, it's the glorious day of the Lord, not the glorious day of His church. It's not the, the glory of the church. It's the glory of God. Verse 21, the most important verse that you've got to know. And anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't matter male, female. It doesn't matter what racial preference they accept. It doesn't matter where they come from. It doesn't matter um, if they're a renter or a buyer. It doesn't matter if they're a golfer or someone else. It, it doesn't matter anything about them. It says anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't say anyone who shows up at church. It's great when you show up to church, especially once we reopen. It, it, but it doesn't say anyone who shows up to church will be saved. It doesn't say anyone who goes to church will be saved. It says anyone who calls on the name of the Lord who is building his church. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord who will become his servant will be saved. Anyone, anyone, doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter what you've been, doesn't matter where you're from, it matters are you willing to call upon the name of the Lord? But see, there's something there. It says they will be saved. See, I think one of the things we need to understand is we all need to be saved. I, I think part of the problem is some people don't think they need to be saved. And the bottom line is every single human being born into this world needs to be saved. There was only one exception, and that was Jesus Christ. We all need to be saved. And that salvation is for anyone who will call on the name of the Lord. Anyone who will call on the name of the Lord. Those are, those are key words. And those are really important. Really, I think, really hard to get confused. Anyone means anyone. For God so loved the whole world. That he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, so that whoever believes in him, anyone who believes in him. But see, the key is, notice it says anyone who believes in him, and this says who calls upon him. See, if you really believe in him, and you really believe what he says about himself, that he came to seek and save that which was lost, then if you really believe that he's the Savior, then you will call on him to save you. Anyone asked will not be turned away. You see, the idea is in order to be saved, you've got to believe, and then you've got to act upon that belief because faith without actions is dead and useless. When we go on, it says in verse 22, people of Israel, listen, pay attention. God publicly endorsed Jesus of Nazareth See, it doesn't say, God publicly endorsed me, Peter, the rock. It says, God publicly endorsed Jesus of Nazareth by doing wonderful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. In other words, you've seen and you've heard his miracles. Now, the interesting thing is, is Jesus sent out his disciples and he told them to do these kind of miracles and God did great things through them. But that wasn't brought up here because the main emphasis is not on what people did or what people are doing. It's Jesus Christ and him alone. People of Israel, listen. God, God, Almighty God, publicly endorsed Jesus of Nazareth, by doing wonderful miracles, wonders, and signs through Jesus, as you well know. So Peter said, I'm not giving you anything you didn't already know, but I'm explaining to you what took place. 
In verse 23, how indicting is this? Okay, as you know, God did great miracles through Jesus Christ. And you, notice what verse 23 says, but with the knowledge that you have, but in seeing the thousands fed, the people raised from the dead, uh, the storm stopped, all these things, healings that could never be explained in human terms. And you saw that, and you know it happened. But instead, you followed God's prearranged plan. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You followed the, God, the plan that God already had, right? So God had chosen this, and you fell right into place with what God said would happen. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to the cross and murdered him. Wait a minute. Okay, okay, so Peter, um, he wouldn't last a second today, but he stands up and he says, okay, listen to me, listen to me. You all know that God put his endorsement on Jesus Christ, and in your presence, and in your knowledge, in your understanding, he did all these miracles and signs and wonders through Jesus, and then you killed him. So, in other words, Peter said, wait a minute, you murdered the Messiah. Now, how would we respond to that? You murdered the Messiah. Get away from me. You repulse me. I can't hang with you. You murdered the Messiah. Well, let's back up, because number one, God said it was his plan to have the Messiah murdered by human beings. And let's back up to what we already know. In reality, it was our sins that murdered him. And so in reality, you and I, who weren't even there, murdered the Messiah. And so let's look back at verse 23. But you followed God's prearranged plan. You fell into place. And with the help of lawless Gentiles, the Romans, you nailed him to the cross. In other words, you can't blame the Romans. And the Romans can't blame the Jews. Because you were all in it together. You know, they washed their hands, say, okay, I find him innocent. I'm washing my hands of this. Do what you want. But I'll have my guys crucify him. Right? No, he says humanity was in this together. Jew and Gentile alike was in this together. And it says, and you murdered him on the cross. But verse 24 says, however, however, okay, you murdered him, but God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life again. For death could not keep him in its grips. So let's paint the picture All right, you did the wrong thing, but it fit into God's plan. And even though you did the wrong thing, God worked all things together for the good of those that love Him and called according to His purpose. Because even though you murdered Him, God didn't let Him stay dead. God did not let Him rot in the grave for death could not keep its grip. Because God spoke life into the situation. It was hopeless. It was despairing. But God was still in control. In verse 25, King David said this about him. I know the Lord is always with me. Now notice what verse 25 says. Peter speaking again. And, and Peter says, King David, the one that we revere, the one that we claim as heritage, the one that's the ruler of Israel, King David said about Jesus, the Messiah. Notice that's the context, right? 
Because he's talking about Jesus, the Messiah, that you murdered, that God raised from the dead, and King David spoke about him. I know the Lord is always with me, King David said. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder why my heart is filled with joy and my mouth shouts his praises. My body rests in hope. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life and you will give me wonderful joy in your presence. So David says, you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life and you will give me wonderful joy in your presence. Verse 29, dear brothers, think about this. Dear brothers, think about this. You know, sometimes you just take a verse and we're like, oh, you know, David was talking about resurrection and David was talking about himself. And Peter says, brothers, empowered by the Holy Spirit, Peter says, dear brothers, think about this. David wasn't referring to himself. When he spoke these words that I have quoted. For he died and he was buried and his tomb is still here among us. Think about what he's saying. He couldn't have been talking about himself. You see sometimes we have to regroup. And we have to think about the context. And we have to think about what's really being said. Verse 30. Peter continues and he says, but he, David, was a prophet and he knew God had promised with an oath. What is Peter doing? He's tying scripture together and he's giving the good news, tying scripture together to do it. And he says, David, a prophet, knew that God had promised with an oath that one of David's own descendants would sit on David's throne as the anointed one, as the Messiah. Now, when we look in Matthew and we look in Luke, we see the heritage, we see the lineage of Jesus Christ coming through the line of David. And in this passage, in this passage of Acts chapter 2, Peter has already said that Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one. And so, then, and so he's saying, listen to me, we're going back to prophecy. The prophecy that we believe and understand says that on oath, God said that one of David's own descendants would sit on David's throne as the Messiah. David was looking into the future and predicting the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that the Messiah would not be left among the dead and that his body would not rot in the grave. And see, Peter already said that the Holy Spirit did this, that God did this, raised Jesus Christ from the dead, and, and death could not hold him. And so now Peter is connecting Psalms, David's prophecy, with this truth. In verse 32, it says, This prophecy was speaking of Jesus, whom God raised from the dead, and we are all his witnesses. See, that's an important... Peter's not saying, okay, you know, I googled this last night, and it says that this psalm is similar to what's happening, and so I'm putting the pieces together, and, and the Israeli Times said this, and when I, you know, got my tablet out this morning and read the Jerusalem Chronicle, and so I'm tying, no. Peter's saying, this is all prophecy, and, and, and stop right now, because remember, we all saw him. We all witnessed Jesus resurrected. We all ate with him. We all shared with him. We all touched him, communicated with him, heard from him, saw him. And it's all proving that he was 
risen from the dead, just as God prophesied through David that this would happen. Verse 33 says, right now, right now, Jesus Christ, he sits on the throne of highest honor in heaven, at God's right hand, and the Father, as he has promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, just as you see here today. So what you're seeing is Jesus Christ at the place of honor has been given all authority and part of all authority is pouring out His Spirit on all His servants. That's what you're seeing today. God doing a new work through His Spirit in His servants. Verse 34 says, For David himself never ascended into heaven, And yet he said this, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in honor at my right hand. And some people have said that he's talking about David, but David's not the Lord. So the only one he could be talking about is the Lord. Kind of of like, go figure. And so let's put this in easy understanding that we can all get. The Father, Lord Almighty, The Father, God in heaven, said to the Son, Jesus, the Messiah, sit in honor at my right hand. According to Scripture and all that we know, who is sitting at the right hand of God the Father? Jesus. And He's in a place of honor. In a place of authority. And so what you see David saying is... God the Father said to God the Son, Jesus, sit here in honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. So let it be clearly known, let it be understood by everyone in Israel that God has made. Notice the priority here. God has made Jesus whom you crucified to be both Lord and Messiah. Who is Jesus? He is Lord and Messiah. He's not just a good prophet that exalted himself. He's not just a good person who did good deeds and exalted himself. He is Lord. He's God. He's in charge. And he is Messiah. He is the anointed one who did all this not peter not the disciples not david it says god has made this jesus whom you crucified see peter keeps going back to the same thing not talking about a different guy now i'm still talking about the same jesus of nazareth the son of the living god the builder of the church i'm talking about jesus christ the messiah the anointed one, was made this way positionally by God. Jesus was never created. Don't don't misunderstand that. Jesus was always God who put on flesh. He came incarnate, putting on flesh so that He could save us. But Jesus Christ has always been God. He did not become a God. He has always been been God. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He put on flesh to come through the lineage of David and become the sinless, spotless Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. And He is Lord and Messiah. And it is His church. And we answer to Him, uh, God and uh, God alone. In verse 37, Peter's word convicted them deeply, cut to the core. And they said to him and to the other uh, other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? See, the idea is they were convicted. In other words, their conscience was pricked. They weren't condemned and repulsed away, but they were convicted. Their eyes of an understanding were open and they were drawn to God. And so, because they were convicted... And they started 
understanding what the Holy Spirit was saying. They're saying, okay, we're believing what you're saying. We're agreeing with what you're saying. So what should we do with this knowledge? See, you can't just know that God is Lord. You can't just know that Jesus Christ is Lord. You've got to do something with that knowledge. Too many people hear the message, and then they just go away. It's not enough to just hear the message. You've got to respond to it. What should we do? Peter's words were very clear in verse 38. Peter responded. He replied, each of you. So individually, each of you must, you have to, turn from your sins and turn, turn to God. And so the idea is called repentance. You, your sins are doing this, and you turn away from your sins, and you turn to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You turn away from your sins, and you turn to God. How do you get saved? You have to turn away from your old lifestyle. You have to turn away from your sins, and you have to turn away from all of your past to turn to God. And notice what he says. You turn from your sins, you turn to God. Some people say, yeah, I just don't do the things I used to do. It's not enough of just not doing. Now it's doing for Jesus Christ. Doing in His power. Doing in His authority. And he says you must turn from your sins and turn to God. And be baptized. So what's your first act of obedience? Be baptized. You have heard the message. You have responded to the message you've called on the name of the lord to be saved and now your first act of obedience is to be baptized in a sign of repentance saying i'm dying to my old life and i'm raising to my new life and it says you must be baptized in the name of jesus christ for the forgiveness of your sins and then and then after you respond to the message after you've given up your old lifestyle, after you've turned to Jesus Christ as Lord, and after you've been baptized, it says then you'll receive the gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. You notice, it's God's process, and this whole thing is God's message. You can argue about it, you can argue with God about it, because He's the one that said it. This promise... This promise in verse 39 is to you and to your children and even to the Gentiles. In other words, all who have been called by our Lord, by the Lord our God. And so the message is for everyone who has been called. When God gives you the message, if you've heard the message, will you respond today? Will you turn from your lifestyle of sin? Will you turn to Jesus Christ as Lord? Will you be baptized? Will you be His servant? You see, the interesting thing, if we say, I love the Lord, but I'm not going to stop my lifestyle, you haven't really become His servant because you haven't begun to do what He says. I accept Jesus Christ, but I refuse to be baptized. Well, then how have you become His servant? Because a servant does what the master tells him. Scripture tells us that. Common sense tells us that. In verse 40, it says, And then Peter continued preaching for a long time. So obviously, Peter wouldn't last today. But the bottom line, it says, As a normal consequence of being, of being filled with the Spirit, Peter began to preach for a long time. You see, what I know is God has more to say to us than what we can fit into 30 or 40 minutes. God has, I mean, who are we? How dare we say, okay, God, I'm going to be your servant. You got an hour. I'm not going to give you any more. Is that being his servant or is that making God our servant? Well, God, I'll listen to you as long as you speak between this time and this time. I'll come and I'll listen to you speak, God, as long as my tea time doesn't interfere. Are you willing to become his servant? And God, however long you want to talk, we'll talk. 
Notice it says, he had already given him a message, but he kept talking for a long time. It says, strongly urging, strongly urging all of his listeners, save yourselves from this generation that has gone astray. Guaranteed, that's the message of the Holy Spirit today. That's the message to every single human being. Save yourself from this society, from this world that is way gone astray, that has turned to their own ways, that has violated common sense, that has violated good, wholesome practices. God says, turn. Will you be willing to turn? Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to Christ's church, about 3,000. Wow. What, it, what would it be like if God added 3,000 people to His church today? Well, OSHA and CDC would probably have some strong urgings against it. But bottom line is, it would be better to violate man's rules if God is doing something. We don't want to violate man's rules if God's not leading it, if God's not doing it. This was an impromptu thing. This, was, this wasn't a thing where a bunch of people said, you know what, we're just going to build our church. This was God doing it. And notice what it says. These people believed, and so they were baptized, and they were added to the church, about 3,000 in all, and, and they joined with the other believers. They, they bonded with the other believers, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So they devoted themselves to teaching. They didn't just show up on Christmas and Easter. They devoted themselves to the teaching, and devoting yourself to the teaching isn't just knowing it, but it's putting it into practice. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. I know we're struggling with this right now, but the bottom line is, here's the question. When we're allowed to have fellowship, will you be a part of it? You see, the statistic is showing that right now, during this pandemic, all these churches are live streaming and posting the message and less than 50% of the church are even taking the time to watch the service. And, and, and they're saying like 23% of that 50% isn't even watching their own church. So what does that say about our priority? Hey, the pandemic gave me a vacation from God. Oh, no, 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 not from God, from church. It's connected. It's His church. You can't have church without God. You can play church, pretend church, fake church, but you're not going to be the church without God. And so they devoted themselves. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, sharing in the Lord's Supper and in prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and some apostles performed, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. A deep sense of awe came over them all. In verse 44, it's very clear, and all the believers met together on Christmas and Easter. No, it says, and all the believers met together constantly. And shared everything they have. Now I know we can complain that right now we can't do that. But what about when we can? Are you ready to meet together? Are you ready to share together? Are you ready? Are you going to be a part? Next Sunday we're going to open up the church. Are you going to be there? Are you going to be a part? Or are you going to say, well, you know, it's kind of bad timing. Because I've had plans. I've enjoyed eating my cereal and sitting in my pajamas watching the service. See, the question is not what we're doing now, but what we're going to do when we have the opportunity to do something. Verse 45 says, They sold their possessions and they shared the proceeds with those in need. 
And so, and so when you see the church, they, they gathered together, they prayed together, they shared, they helped each other, and they worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and they shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And then the conclusion of this message, the conclusion of this whole summary is this. When they accepted the call, when they accepted Jesus Christ and became his servants, when they devoted themselves to the teaching and to the fellowship and to prayer and to meeting together and taking care of the people, then it says, and each day the Lord added to their group those who were being saved. Each day the Lord added to the numbers. Each day God added more people because the people were being the prophets. Each day, people were coming to the Lord because, see, you have to be coming to the Lord to be added to the church. And each day, the Lord was adding to His church that He built, that He called, that He's in charge of. Each day, He did that when the people were willing to do what He said. When the people were willing to be His servants, filled with His Spirit, then God did what only He could do. You see, we can't build the church. We can't, we can't do it. It's not by might, not by power. It's by His Spirit. I can't save people. All I can do is be the messenger. All I can do is be the spokesperson and let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit does. I, I'm, I'm hoping, I, I, I'm praying that this message has convicted us to become a better church to become Jesus Christ's church and to become empowered by His Holy Spirit to see others come to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to end with this video, um, an invite uh, video from the skit guys. Tough day on the back nine for Joe McElvaney. If he does not sink this putt, he will not move on to Sunday tournament play. However, losing today may not be the worst thing for Joe, considering his love of the game is outweighed by his love for going to church with his family on Sunday mornings. He's a true inspiration for all of us here on the tour. Although, if he's knocked out of the tournament today, the real tragedy won't be that another Sunday will go by without Joe McElvaney advancing to the final round on Sunday. No, the real tragedy is that another Sunday will go by without him inviting his best friend in the whole world to church. You know, you'd think, after all these years, that Joe would consider the fact that his buddy Steve may want to go to church to cleanse himself from his selfish, sinful heathenry. But enough about that. Joe's got a 12-footer to sink here. Do you want to go to church with us tomorrow? Yeah. Thank you. Joe seems a bit distracted today. He really needs to make this putt, or he's gonna have to buy his pagan friend lunch. Miss it! Thank you for joining us online and invite you to join us live in service next week at 9 a.m. Let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Almighty God, I just thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit, that you built your church, that we belong to you. We are called by your name. Father God, I thank you for all those that um, are hearing and seeing this message. Father, I ask that your spirit would impact us in a powerful and mighty way. Uh, make us your church. Re-birth um, your church uh, afresh. 
with, a, with a, a new outpouring of your spirit, a revival like we've never seen before, ushering in the great and blessed day of the Lord. Father, I ask that you would uh, be upon each person today, that we would sense and know your presence, and that we would follow you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.